Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me again on the Heads Together podcast. I'm always so happy to have you with me and never more so than this week. I am joined by a fantastic coach, Gemma Rabini. I've known Gemma for a little while now. She is an awesome coach who helps women who are really going through career transitions or what she calls squiggly career moments. Don't you just love that? And Gemma's joining me today to talk about imposter syndrome. And this is one of those episodes where I don't really know what to expect from this conversation because Gemma has a different name for imposter syndrome. And she hasn't shared with me what that is yet. And she said it's, you know, it's quite a paradigm shift around looking at imposter syndrome and what it is and why it holds us back and how we can overcome it. I know that many of you deal with imposter syndrome regularly. I know it's something that pops its head up quite often. Um, I know that because you tell me it's one of the questions I get asked the most is around how to deal with imposter syndrome when it comes to growing your business. So I think this is going to be a really interesting episode. I think we're going to get a lot out of this. Can't wait for you to meet Gemma. Welcome, welcome to the Heads Together podcast. I'm Jill Mokes and I am obsessed with cutting through the noise when it comes to growing your business. Each week, via intimate coaching conversations and inspirational stories, I share what it really takes to get the results you want in a way that feels right to you. I am all about attracting higher ticket opportunities, building authentic relationships and creating the abundant, full fat version of your dream business. I mean, how many of us have beavered away creating a light version of what we really want? The thing is, I honestly believe when you're outstanding at what you do, there is no limit to what you can achieve. So, are you ready to put our heads together and make it happen? Let's go. Hi, Gemma. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? I am brilliant, thank oh, you. I'm so happy to have you join me. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, oh, good, good, good. I'd love you to tell our listeners a bit about yourself. And um, I was just, <laughs> the reason I hesitated then was because one of the things that I loved that you put in your email when we corresponded recently was that you help women with squiggly career moments. Yeah. Ah, I love that. Tell me what that is and what you do. I love the word squiggle because I think it just has no negative positive. It's just something that happens. And the way that I define career squiggles is anything that kind of takes you away from a linear expected journey. So a squiggle in your career could be maternity leave. It could be a redundancy. It could be reassessing what you want to do and going, do you know what? This doesn't fit me anymore. I'm going to do something different. So where your career squiggles around and perhaps you might have a portfolio career for a bit, you might go into a different industry, just where it kind of doesn't feel like you've taken the expected route. And I love that because it can cover a multitude of things, you know, redundancy, menopause. And at those squiggly moments, your confidence is often at a, a funny place and you need you're transitioning into something different so I love the word squiggle just because it reminds me of you know it's that childhood enjoyment isn't it it is where's this gonna go I love it too it really stood out to me as oh my god and just as then as you explained the context that you use it in it's like so spot on because you're right, it is a squiggle. <laughs> it's not always a dip or a peak in terms of what's going on for us. Sometimes it is a complete squiggle. Yeah. So I really like that. Yeah. So who do you tell us who you work with and what you do? I tend to work typically with women who are facing a squiggle of some sort. So corporate women, women in business, 
Um, a lot of women who are coming back from maternity leave, because that's kind of a, a chosen squiggle in some ways. And I also work with women who have been made redundant, often from a long time in corporate world, which is often not a chosen squiggle, but it's something that's kind of forced on them. And I particularly love working with women because I think pretty much every woman is brilliant, but often doesn't realise it. And I just love that ability to just pull out the brilliance in somebody and be able to kind of hold a mirror up and say, this is what I see and let them see themselves in a different way. So I think women need a bit of cheerleading sometimes. And yeah, so I love that. I really totally resonate with that. I think you're absolutely right. And I think as coaches, I think that's the massive satisfaction we get, isn't it? Is holding up that mirror and saying, look at you, look at what you can do. I think, yeah, that's one of the most fulfilling parts of what we do. Yeah. Absolutely. I think a lot of the time women put a lot of shoulds in there. They should themselves all the time. They do should yeah. themselves. Just because I can, I probably should. I should have this kind of career. I should look like this when I come back from maternity leave. A leader should be like this. And I just... I've got to scrap the should. Yeah, ditch the should. I think that is so true. Um, I catch myself doing it mm. all the time too. And I think the key is recognising when you're doing it, isn't it? And just catching yourself yes. when you are shoulding, yeah. shoulding yourself. Yeah. Do you see that a lot with the women you work with, that they are kind of putting these expectations on themselves that aren't necessarily even what they want. Yeah, I think it's such a good point. And I particularly think that women are, perhaps from the women that I speak to, not particularly good at giving themselves space to even think about what they might want to do or how they might want to be. So therefore, what fills the gap is this societal expectation. When I have a baby, I should be happy when I go back to work, I should be able to do the number of hours that I was before I went off. If I'm made redundant, I will be expected to go into the same job somewhere else. And it's like, have you actually given yourself the space and time and the massive bits of A3 paper to just dream and go, what do I want? Not what do I think I should want? What does my mother-in-law think I should do? What does my husband expect me to do? And I think the shoulds kind of creep in because we haven't got anything else to aim for or to kind of anchor ourselves on so yeah I hear a lot of shoulds mm. and it interestingly it can be quite easy to just let them slide and as a woman coaching women I do it to myself as well so when people say well I should do this you kind of go yeah oh hang on you, you have to spot them you have to be quite alert to them yes I agree I completely agree I think that's interesting what you just said about sometimes we're not great at giving ourselves space to think about what we really want. And I think that is so true. Yeah. But I think we're also pretty bad sometimes at going after what we really want. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Because again, women tend to have this expectation on themselves or kind of wherever it comes from of being in service to other people and I hear a lot of people who I coach saying well I need to take so and so to ballet and so I can't go to that because I need to do this and I I want you know and they they will prioritize other people's stuff whether it's children whether it's family whether it's neighbors and I think society dictates that women should be amenable and kind and giving and building rapport keeping their head down and not being too disruptive and actually why should we there's a lot of things that mean that we restrict ourselves because we put everyone else's desires ahead of our own and if you are a people pleaser like I am that is exacerbated beyond belief so actually what you're left with is like what time have I got left to do anything that I want to do personally what I learned going back from one of my maternity leaves was actually happy mum happy baby like I need to prioritize what I need to do even if that is just going for a 10 minute walk around the block once a day and it might not be massive things but I think building that confidence to be kind of wisely selfish about how you spend your time selfish 
it's quite a negative word or it's used in quite a negative way. But when you've got a dream, you need to be wisely selfish about how you're going to spend your time and how you're going to move towards it. So, yeah, it's very, very mm. true. I love the phrase wisely selfish because you're right. I think selfish has negative connotations, but it's certainly not a negative concept like prioritizing yourself at times is absolutely essential for your health your well-being of your family everything you know you need to be selfish interestingly and I don't always love differentiating between the genders but I do think that it is something that women are quicker to accuse themselves of being selfish I think than men are. It seems to be that's something, and I think you're right. It's that societal expectation of women as being nurturing and caretakers. Yeah. I felt that the wisely bit for me made a massive difference when I was kind of spoken to about it by one of my coaches. And I thought, wisely, it's very conscious and it's very deliberate and it doesn't need to be just. I'm selfish, I'm going to bang my fists on the table, I need this, I need that. But it's about being really conscious about what does prioritising myself mean to me? Is it a walk? Is it a coffee with a friend once a month? Actually, is it having a bath on a Sunday night? Is It It can be really small things or it could be massive things. Is it putting my child into childcare when I don't technically need to? Is that what I need in order to top myself up so that I can give my best to the world in whatever way that means? But yeah, the wisely was just very, very interesting in terms of the language you use around it, because otherwise selfish to me is just, you know, stamp your feet and want something that you haven't got and get cross if you haven't got it. You're absolutely right. The language of, of using wisely makes it completely intentional versus a default position. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, being cross and angry with the world and wanting something different. Yeah. So I know in today's episode, we are going to have a little chat about imposter syndrome because that definitely, and I think we both agree on this, don't we, that that's one of the things we come across with clients a lot when it comes to going after what they really want. So, you know, those clients who do make the time and space to figure out what they want, then come up against this second great big hurdle, which is that imposter syndrome that tells them that maybe they're not good enough to go after that. So I'm really excited to hear from you, your take on this, because I know you have a slightly kind of like a shift in paradigm on this, don't you? Yeah, so I feel that the phrase imposter syndrome makes it feel like something that you suffer from, that it's a lurgy of some sort. And so I kind of reject that phraseology because I think it's got quite negative connotations and I feel like it takes away the empowerment from anyone to do anything about it. So imposter syndrome, and I have got a new name for it, is essentially that gap between how you see yourself and how others see you a lot of the time that gap is the feeling of not being worthy not being good enough keeping your head down hoping no one notices which a lot of people say oh it's just quite humble but actually if you let that carry on that's got some quite negative issues that can come as a result as I say I don't like the phrase imposter syndrome so I've kind of rebranded it to high achievers doubt because so Ooh. imposter syndrome only really rears its head when you are kind of in a growth, a period of growth, something that you're doing that's different from what you were perhaps really super comfortable doing. So it's actually a really positive thing. And if you are a high achiever, you are naturally pushing yourself. So actually, if you are a high achiever, you just have moments of doubt. It's not that you're doubting yourself in the whole of your world and your whole of your life. But what you're doing is driving for something and striving for, you know, a great result or a different lifestyle or something amazing. And you just have that doubt. And I think actually it can be a really positive thing because if you had no doubt and you just were kind of blazing on regardless, totally oblivious to how you were coming across or sort of oh is that correct or do I have enough evidence for that I think you could 
potentially land stuff in a suboptimal way. You could perhaps kind of come across in a way that you don't consciously want to. So I think those moments of doubt are actually quite valuable. And actually, most people who are high achievers, you have a higher proportion of people in that category that suffer from this sort of moments of doubt and this kind of this high achievers doubt. I love the thought of the moments of doubt almost being these little markers just to draw your attention back to being in the moment and checking in on yourself on what you're doing. What a brilliant reframe that is. So instead of the imposter syndrome, which is kind of this very I think quite often when I think of imposter syndrome and when I talk to clients about it, it can be as severe as feeling very yeah. paralyzing. And I think this reframe of looking at it like, well, hang on, the fact you're pushing yourself to do something that's outside of your comfort zone means you're already that kind of high achiever who's aiming high, who's reaching forward And so those moments of doubt are your little markers just to check in on yourself. Um, I really like that idea. And sometimes it's as simple as, you know, you're about to stand up and give a presentation in front of loads of people and you suddenly think, you know, oh, I haven't, I don't know, been in their position. So how will I ever, you know, how will I ever be able to deliver this message? And actually what it might trigger you to do is go, do you know what? I'm going to call that out. And I'm going to say, guys, I've never done your job and I couldn't imagine X, Y, Z. But, you know, the information I need to give you today is blah. And it just makes you, it, it sometimes connects you with your audience better, or it could mean that you position something in a, in a different way, or just that you go, is that really the best way? Have, you know, have I really thought about what it is that I'm doing here? And I, I think it's, it is a marker. It's a lovely way to think about it, actually, as kind of a, just a point of going and also a point of going oh this is feeling a little bit squiggly and potentially a bit of a trigger but why is that yeah i was just going to say you know how can that how can we start looking at those kind of oh deep breath moments that feel uncomfortable how can we suddenly think okay if i'm feeling that i know i'm doing something right and yeah. something good's going to come next yeah. and it often means that someone else has put their trust in you or belief in you to do something And that's the other thing that you do the whole big breath thing. But often some of the reasons why you're doing starting something new, starting a new role, starting your own business, doing something new is actually because someone else has gone, I believe in you or they've gone, you should do that. You'd be really good. So I think, you know, sometimes the growth moments are you have to kind of realize where they've come from. And then the trigger of like, okay, this is me doing it now. This is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love the picture you painted just now of if you were going to do a big speech, for example, and just that maybe call out if you're feeling that you don't know something. And that really resonates with me. I I am a massive fan of really like radical transparency, radical authenticity. So and I think it absolutely is one of the keys to banishing that imposter syndrome is Imposter syndrome can only thrive if on some level you think you're pretending to be something you're not. So anytime you get that opportunity to be really radical in your transparency and share exactly the truth of where you are and what you do and and how you do it, I think that makes it really hard for imposter syndrome to thrive. I love that so much because you take away the armor. It's a vulnerable thing to do. But once you take away that armor, no one needs to feel like they need a sword to kind of fight you because they're like, oh, but you've come to this like a human and you get so much more respect. Be authentic and say, actually, I'm a bit worried about telling you this. I mean, your guard goes right down, doesn't it, as the person receiving that news to say, do you know what? This is the first time I've delivered news like this and I'm actually I'm actually feeling a bit anxious about it. And I really hope that I deliver it in a way that really respects you or, you know, and you can kind of, people just are quite shocked, particularly if you're in quite a senior level role or you're leading a business or you're leading a team. It just changes the dynamic. And I think I love the idea, your words around this radicalness around transparency. I think that's, it's like magic when someone actually interacts with you as a human. Agree. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's refreshing. It, like you say, it puts the other person in the frame of not needing any armor or like you say, no one needs a sword no. if you've taken off your armor. So I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. So Jenna, is, is imposter syndrome you find, uh, do you find it something that you are tackling with your clients over and over? Do yeah. you find that's quite it's a often the reason that people come to me because they have heard this phrase. And that's why it's quite an interesting one, because it's become quite societally appropriate and kind of OK to say, I've got it. I'm suffering from the lurgy. I've got this imposter syndrome. So people often come to me in that kind of guise to say really resonated with me I've been given a big promotion perhaps at work or I've moved to this company and I'm now in charge of a bigger team and I just feel like I'm trying to put up my barriers and I'm trying to sort of give this persona and I can't talk to anyone about it because I've pretended and I've they feel like they fraudulently got this job and it's like fraud is quite a strong word isn't it isn't that funny? It is. And I think that's a word that women use quite a lot, actually, saying, oh, I feel like a fraud. And it's so the wrong word, because that just suggests intention around deceiving yeah. someone. And actually, all we're trying to do is just in better ourselves, either in the stretch of skill or passion to change something or more purposeful kind of work. And the number of times I hear women, I was in a shop the other day and I heard these two women talking. It was essentially a competition to see who could be the biggest like hot mess. One of them was like, I don't know why they still employ me. I only did, you know, two hours work yesterday. Oh, they're going to find me out. The other one was like, I've forgot the lunch boxes. I haven't done this, the PTA, I'm back on. And it was lit. I was listening to them being like, oh my gosh, you are, you are literally just competing to be the biggest disastrous it's like disaster top yeah. trumps. And and I was just kind of like, oh my gosh, but it's so normalized that there's something about being the person in that conversation who can say, who can stop it because it's quite escalating. And it's something that women do all the time to each other, to themselves. And actually no one calls it out because it's somehow just a thing that is socially acceptable to be oh I'm a disaster I'm a disaster sometimes you look at like the emojis that you use and there's like the head plant the face smack or the face of the oh yes I, I use that all, all the, the time. time I was scrolling through my phone and I was like I wonder why I use that and I think the reason is that it just makes you seem a little bit less threatening to anyone else who's around so you're like oh I forgot your birthday face plant and it's like well but I forgot your birthday because like I'm running a business and I've got two children under six and I'm doing all these things and I've, you know, I'm helping these people or I'm driving towards my goals. I don't have to be like face plant. Or... Yeah, I'm not an idiot. I just forgot your birthday. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I'm sorry and I wish I hadn't. But actually, it doesn't mean I'm less of a human. Absolutely. Gosh, you know, that's I'd never really thought of that before, but that blooming face plant emoji creeps in yep. everywhere I'm going to be really mindful of when I use that now and I hope everyone listening I I hope you do too because I think mm. that's a big one it's a tiny thing but it is really indicative of the way we put ourselves down habitually yeah. and it's as like well. would you do that to a fr if a friend said I forgot your birthday would you send that back to them and it's like just challenging yourself on would you do that to someone else? No, because it would make them feel bad and it would make them feel like they were sort of failed at remembering your birthday. And if you wouldn't do it to a friend, why'd you do it to yourself? And interesting because when we do that to ourselves, when we do put ourselves down in that way, is it any wonder that we allow the imposter syndrome to creep in? Because we're, we're on the one hand, we're telling ourselves that we've done something silly or we've made a mistake or we're not good enough. On the other hand, we try and push ourselves to do something that's stretching and then wonder why we don't fill up to the job. They're very linked, yeah. aren't they? And I think one of the ways that I sort of talk to clients about how to kind of counteract it is actually to just recognise when the voices in your head are saying something to you and almost call them out as a voice in itself. So don't think that's my actual thought. That's true. That's part of me. But kind of go, 
if I've said I'm not good enough or if I've said I've let them down or if I've said, you know, somehow I'm an imposter because I've done something, almost just kind of go, well, that's interesting. That voice said that and separate it from your own brain because we kind of trust our brains to be right and to keep us safe and to be the truth. But in reality, those negative voices that are kind of coming into our brain saying you're not good enough or whatever, if you can kind of almost separate them from truth and say, oh, that's a mean voice. What did that, that said that I wasn't good. I wonder what was going on there. I wonder why it thinks that about me rather than it. But, you know, we internalize it immediately, don't we? And say, well, I'm not good enough. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. The other useful one is, is that true? That's a simple one as well to use, you know, so separating the voices, as you say, couldn't agree more. And also saying, but is that true? Because we do often, like you said earlier, we do catastrophize as well. So we might make a very small mistake and suddenly we're the biggest idiot in the world. Was that true? Or did I just make a tiny mistake? Yeah, yeah. Was that just a tiny bit of something that went really, really well? And the other thing that I like after, is that true, is... Is it helpful? Because actually, I do speak to women. Well, I speak to a lot of people, but women particularly that say, actually, it is helpful to have that thought because it means that next time I'll do something different. So even, you know, I'm a complete failure. Is it true? No. But I feel like I failed because I hadn't spent enough time preparing the technology and that made me feel stressed. So next time I'm going to do X, Y, Z. So sometimes it's about acknowledging that, is it helpful? Well, a tiny bit of it might be helpful. The rest of that feeling of failure might be completely useless in terms of a positive thought. It's like weeding out the helpful bit, holding on to that, and then recognising the rest of this catastrophizing. Yeah, it's like the dandelion. It is like a proper dandelion in your like meadow of flowers and just kind of going, do I want that? No, I'll just pick the bits that I want. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, but tell me one thing. What is it like when someone comes to you and they feel like they're, like you said earlier, it's not a great way to put it, but they're suffering from imposter syndrome. And then they have this reframe. You know, it's not imposter syndrome. I love your phrase of it's um, high achievers doubt. I just absolutely love that. And Once they get that kind of reframe and are able to see things through that slightly different paradigm, what do you see? Oh my gosh, this is why I do this job because when people have that change of reframing or whatever you kind of think about it, their confidence just grows and grows. And every time you see them, they're pushing themselves a little bit more into an area, perhaps a conversation that they wouldn't have had or something that they wouldn't have necessarily vocalized or something they wouldn't have been brave enough to do. And I think, you know, people visiting parents, that estranged parents that they haven't seen for, for ages because they, you know, their kind of feelings of imposter syndrome were driven from a father who always said X, Y, Z about them. And they were like, do you know what? I matter just because I exist I matter because I exist and I am a full person and actually just accepting themselves for who they are and what they are and accepting that they're not perfect and nobody's perfect and almost just resetting expectations for themselves. And I think when people do that, you just see, they just seem taller. They just walk, they sit taller and they walk taller and they, the way that they talk about themselves is different. And That is, I just love the change in people, but it's all come from them. And they've made the realizations and they've kind of realigned the things that weren't quite going right for them and the pressure they were putting on themselves. And I always think of it like a car. When you're younger, there's certain things that you learn to think like that. You learn survival when you're younger, when you're a child, when you're kind of developing your personality. But if you're driving a car, you start in first gear and then you change to second gear. And then by the time you're at sixth gear, you're just powering along. And actually, I don't think necessarily that we do that consciously. And I think allowing someone to see imposter syndrome for what it is allows them to change gear and kind of move on to the life that they want to live. It's just amazing. I just want to wave my clients into the distance. That's wonderful. I love that metaphor. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. In my head, I'm totally picturing it. And and in my head, the client has their arm waving out the window and, and watching you in their rear view mirror. So <laughs> yeah, they're going around, you know, the top gear kind of road. They've got the stig on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> for yeah, our, yeah. Our, for my American listeners, that's going to mean nothing whatsoever. So <laughs> I might put a link. I might put a link in the show notes to uh, Top Gear. <laughs> really, that has been a really enlightening conversation, and I just love that reframe. I think for everyone listening, that's going to really land because, like everything in life and business, things are choices we have choices of how to feel and choices of how to look at something so I just really appreciate that reframe I think it's absolutely great tell me for anyone listening who would love to find out more about you and how they can reach out to you or read more so my company is coach and bloom and I am on LinkedIn a lot and hanging out there writing various things that come into my mind about how people can navigate these squiggly moments in their careers and my website is www.coachandbloom.co.uk so I all my packages are on there and I just love chatting to people and I do a free kind of initial discovery call just to kind of see if there's the right chemistry for people if I can help them transition in the right way into you know waving them into the distance in their Ferrari around you know the top gear mountainside (laughs) love it yes I love it love it I will pop all of those links into the show notes and I just want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing that. it's been so enjoyable and I just loved our conversation and could talk about this stuff all day but I realized you've got a limit (laughs) well we'll end this one and then we can carry on afterwards now that's actually mean that's that's really mean everyone's going to feel like they've been left out now. <laughs> you know what the answer is you're going oh, to have to okay. come on again. <laughs> I'd love it I'd love it thank you so you're much you're more than welcome thank you for having me I hope you enjoyed this episode and that getting our heads together this week has filled your mind with what's possible If you love the show, would you do me a massive favour, please? Would you leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts? It would really help me put more heads together, reach more ears and expand more minds. Until next week, bye for now.